Okay, I'm... so camera's off, people. Yep, so um, we... Me. Am I good to get started, Jim? Yes, you are. It's five o'clock. Right. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. All righty. Here we are. And share. All right, so. Yes, um, you are. You're good to go. Awesome. Lucy so Seaman, if I could ask you to turn your screen. camera off. Oh, is there an echo? There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So guys, I am excited to be presenting about beach images. This is a topic that I never thought I would be talking about, and I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, here we are, and I'm really excited about it. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am, why beach photography can be really hard, uh, how I actually learned to love it, and then I'll get into my 15 tips. So it might be a, uh, a good idea for you to grab a pen and paper if you would like to take notes for the tips, but uh, this recording will also be available later. So who am I? Um, I am a photographer, but I identify really strongly with being an educator and a researcher. Um, I specialize in landscape photography, but I combine all of my photography with my PhD research, which is focused on um, climate change issues and how that impacts indigenous people around the world. Specifically, I focus a lot on Greenland, which I could totally talk about endlessly, but that is not the topic for tonight. So feel free to message me if you want more information about Greenland. Um, some of my favorite partnerships that I have are with the Arctic Arts Project, which is an amazing nonprofit, uh, Munch Workshops, and of course, Nisi for putting on this amazing presentation, thanks to them. Um, also, a couple of other cool organizations that I've had a chance to work with. So, learning to love the beach. That was a long road for me. Um, I am not a beach person. If the red hair didn't give it away, the beach is not a place that you would normally catch me. Pretty much everything at the beach is trying to kill me from uh, the fact that I'm not a strong swimmer and that I get sunburned really easily and that I'm convinced sand has no redeeming qualities. But... I, I've really avoided the beach my entire life. I felt, especially for a photography standpoint, that there was just nothing to take a picture of. These were my initial impressions. There's nothing to take a picture of at the beach. It's pretty boring. There's no good subject matter. Uh, every picture at the beach always looked the same. Sand, water, sun. It's pretty much the same thing over and over again. Uh, I felt that the beach never changed, that it was not a dynamic environment and that it pretty much always looked the same way. And I also felt that you can only get so many sunsets before finally you get sick of them. Uh, and every sunset eventually kind of starts to look the same. And these are the reasons that I had in my head for why I never took pictures of the beach, even though I'm a landscape photographer. It was the one landscape that I avoided, completely avoided as much as possible. Uh, so why is the beach so hard? Um, because it can be really boring. Shooting at the beach can be super boring. I'm not talking about this type of beach, right? We've all seen these amazing, coastal shots with rocks and mountains and all this action and dynamism going on in the scene. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about this type of beach. It's the exact location that pretty much every single one of you are going to end up at at some point in your life. You're going to go on a family vacation to a beach that looks something like this. It's a whole lot of white sand and not a whole lot else. So this is Pensacola Beach. And uh, it is where I currently live, which is a total shock to me. <laughs> uh, I learned to love the beach because I didn't have a choice. Um, COVID forced me to learn to love the beach. So when I, uh, I, before COVID happened, I was fully nomadic. I lived on the road. I alternated between workshops that I was teaching, bouncing around between friends and family, um, constantly, living in a car, living in a, you know, camper. I was just on the road full time. Um, and when COVID happened, I didn't have a choice. I had to put down roots somewhere. And the choice that I made was to go where my family had moved after I had left home, which was Pensacola, Florida. So Pensacola, Florida is a, as you can see, a very flat, white, sandy beach. 
definitely not somewhere that I thought that I was ever going to end up being someone that really doesn't like the beach very much. Um, but it's where my family was and it made the most sense at the time. Now with lockdown and everything, I'm sure many of you can relate. We got pretty creatively starved. Um, a lot of us were struggling to find things to shoot. I personally was really struggling with staying inspired to get out and shoot. Um, and I felt like I had moved into what I called it this adventure wasteland where there was nothing I wanted to take a picture of, nothing captivated my imagination, and I was very not thrilled to be here. Now, if you're a beach person, maybe you can't relate, but understand that me not being a beach person, this was kind of like my idea of hell being in this type of location with what I thought nothing to shoot. But I learned to love it. Oh, let's see. I finally learned to love the beach. Um, what I ended up doing was I promised myself that I was going to get over my phobia uh, and that I was going to get out every single day. I set my alarm. I woke up, you know, five in the morning for sunrise every single day. I went out to the beach for months every day. Um, I was tenacious about it and I was determined that I was eventually going to find a way to shoot the beach in a way that I was excited to do it and that I could create really compelling, interesting landscape images, something I thought might be impossible to do, but it was a challenge that I was willing to accept. So in the course of doing this, I'm not even going to pretend to you that I'm a beach photography expert. Hardly. I'm scratching the surface. Um, but I've committed a huge number of hours in early mornings and coffee cups to going out and shooting, and I've learned a lot in this time. So I'm going to go over what I consider to be my top 15 tips. Um, what you can expect from this is that I'll breeze over a couple of the more basic ones, but I'm including them because the audience is probably a very wide level of photography skills, so it could be helpful to include them anyway. And then we'll spend more time on certain topics. Um, I've also included lots of images throughout with some of my settings, so you can see kind of uh, where my settings are when I'm going through these shots. So without further ado. Uh, the first one, it feels obvious for those of us who have been shooting for a while, but if you're just getting started, my number one tip is going to be shoot in RAW. There's a million reasons that I could tell you why you should be shooting in RAW, but for beach photography in particular, uh, RAW is very important. The reason for this is that beach images tend to have extremely high dynamic range because you're usually shooting at sunset or sunrise and the water is dark. So you have this huge dynamic range with a bright sky and a dark foreground. And if you're not shooting in raw, then you're not going to have all the information that you want in that picture later so that you can edit it. So having extra data means you have a much better chance to recover highlights and shadows when you're editing later on when you get home. So definitely you want to shoot in raw. And also and another reason is raw gives you more flexibility with your white balance. And when you are at a beach surrounded by white surf, white sand, and a bright white sky, your white balance can get really messed up. Um, so having a little bit more flexibility with that in post is super important. The second one is keep your lens clean so you don't end up with a picture like this. Um, I shot that entire morning and clearly I wasn't fully awake yet because every single image came out like this, which was blurry because I had gotten uh, some sea spray on the lens like right off the bat and not a single picture was salvageable, even though I had amazing lighting conditions. It's very frustrating. So keeping your lens clean is a constant battle. Uh, you don't want to end up with pictures that could have been great and ended up not being so awesome because it's covered in spots on your lens. So one of my tricks that I do for this is using lens wipes instead of microfiber cloths. The reason for this is because the wind coming off of the water is constantly bringing spray onto your lens, just the tiniest little drops of spray, and it builds up over a while. If you're using a microfiber cloth, it tends to smear really badly when you're talking about salt water. And another problem is that if you're reusing it multiple times, 
if you were to get a grain of sand on that cloth and then rub your lens, you're going to have a very sad day. So I always use lens wipes over a microfiber cloth. There are lots of cheap options available online. So definitely should be looking at getting some of those. They're also really good for just cleaning the whole exterior of the camera body and getting some of the salty spray off. Um, there's nothing that's going to ruin your gear faster than leaving any type of salt uh, film on your equipment. So this is super, super important. I didn't have a picture of me actually in the water, which is surprising because when I'm at the beach, I probably spend most of my time right in the surf line. Um, but in this picture, you'll see my favorite beach accessory, which is my boots. Um, so you're going to get wet. You need to accept it. You don't want to be one of those little birds that you see on the shore that's constantly running back and forth. So it's best to just accept that you're going to probably get the lower half of your body soaked and just commit to it right away. So don't let the water stop you from getting the shots that you want. A lot of the time, I like to get right into the surf. Um, you can create these beautiful leading lines if you do long exposures, or you can photograph the actual surf line itself. So it's a really good place to be and just accept that you're going to get wet. So either roll up the pants or bring some awesome knee-high boots like these and you can stay dry, especially in the winter. That has been a saver for me because otherwise I don't think I'd have the courage to be on the beach barefoot. Let's see. The fourth one is about knowing your tides. Um, now you don't have to be a professional mariner, um, but it's really helpful to understand how the tidal patterns affect the place where you live. If you fail to do this, you're going to be missing awesome opportunities. And this is something that I figured out really early on. Um, each beach is altered by the tides differently. And at my beach, there's a particular place that I've learned uh, at low tide, you get these very flat shore, like what you see in this picture, and all of the shells get stranded up on the shore. So I love when uh, tide is low, especially around uh, sunset or sunrise, because you can get beautiful light, you get this a uh, nice flat area and you can get all these seashells um, to create some great foregrounds. So you really need to understand the tides. Um, also, if you have high tide in something like a pier, you could get the waves smashing into it. So it's just good to know where the tides are, kind of following the tide charts and understanding your particular beach and how it's going to affect the location that you're shooting. Some of this happens just with practice but it really just does help to do a quick Google of the tides so you know what time to get out there and get shooting. So uh, some of the ways that it can change your beach, like I mentioned, is gonna be these sandbars that form. Also some really cool sand patterns. You can get great ripples in the sand, um, pools and scalloping. Uh, Jennifer Cordy did actually a presentation for Nisi not too long ago, and she had some beautiful pictures of scallop sand, which was caused by the tide going out. I wish we got something like that where I live because it, it created some beautiful images. And this is just something if you're paying attention to the tides that you'll know in advance and that you can plan for. Finding a focal point. Uh, beach photography can be boring. I already said it. I'll say it again. <laughs> beach photography can be really, really boring because once you've exhausted that classic wide angle shot of a sweeping shoreline, there's not a whole lot else you can do. So it's so important that you find a focal point to help anchor your image. <laughs> we have some drawing going on. I don't know what that is. Um, so uh, if you find something like in this case, I used a shell and then the foam line coming in, uh, that was a really cool element. I also like using things like the vegetation. I have some suggestions for really cool anchor spots. So shells are obvious, although they can be way harder than you might think to photograph. They're also moving when the water hits them. Interesting patterns and ripples. You can use rocks if you're lucky enough to have them at the beach you're visiting. I don't have any rocks at Pensacola Beach, so I'm pretty starved in that aspect. Driftwood is a great one. If you find a cool piece of driftwood, I suggest carrying it around with you, leaving it in your vehicle, uh, bringing it out so you can creatively place the driftwood. Vegetation is also awesome. 
silhouettes of people and birds. There's so many things that you can find to create focal points in your image. And having a focal point allows your viewer's eye to kind of sit in the middle of that image or wherever you've placed it and dwell for a minute. You don't want your viewer to look at your picture, oh cool, another sunset, and then they're off to the next thing. You want them to stare at it and enjoy it and wonder how that shell is, or is that wave coming in? Did the wave hit the shell? You're, you're creating the story by anchoring a focal point in your image. Very important. Another focal point, this is just some vegetation with some interesting clouds. It's not, the most exciting thing, but by creating this focal point and balancing the cloud right above it, it creates this interesting dynamic in the image itself. Um, and I used a polarizer in this case to help make the clouds really pop and give them that three-dimensional feel. So a polarizer is another favorite tool that I love to use out at the beach. Here's another example of a focal point. Found some nice little flowers with the sunset behind them. So you get nice and low and you let the flower kind of be the place where the viewer's eye is gonna rest. And then it's easy to carry that viewer's gaze through the image to where the sun is coming uh, down below the horizon. This is probably my favorite tip out of all of my tips, which is continuous shooting mode. Um, continuous shooting is absolutely the best technique to use at the beach. If you've ever done any type of coastal photography, you know that timing is everything. And finding out how to time that perfect shot right when the wave is coming in or going out, that's really tricky. It's quite difficult to do. So one of the things that I like to do is use continuous shooting mode and I watch for a little while to see the movement of the water and then I start to shoot right before the action starts and then I hold my shutter down or shutter open through the full motion and let the camera continue to shoot throughout. It's going to generate a huge number of images, but you're going to have a lot to choose from. So if you're photographing the water definitely try continuous shooting mode. It's gonna give you way more options when you're going through these images later. So you can go through and you can pick and you can identify um, what the best time was, what the best shot was, and you're not going to miss that shot because you didn't get the shutter pressed in time. Another really cool thing is that uh, every wave is different. And when you spend every single day trying to create images at the beach, you'll realize that not a single wave ends up being the same. And when you're doing continuous shooting, then you're able to really capture the full range of each wave and you'll see how unique and different each one of them are. It's actually a lot of fun uh, to go through them later and see if you have the magic shot. Like I said, the technique is to begin shooting right before the motion and shoot through the full end of the motion. That way you have multiple chances to get the shot. Uh, for focusing mode, that's um, kind of part of continuous shooting where you have to be careful how you're focusing your image. If you have a camera that has great continuous focus, that's a really interesting mode to try, but it's you're going to have to kind of refine this technique with your specific camera gear to see what focusing mode is going to work best for you. I often will do manual focus because I study where the wave ends up at the moment that I want to capture that motion. I focus for that spot and then I just continuously wait. And doing manual focus means sometimes I'm going to miss the shot because the wave's going to be either too far back or too far forward. But when it is just in that zone that I'm trying to capture, it's going to be sharp and you're not worried about how do I autofocus on this moving object that's coming directly at me? So try different focusing modes to find out what might work best for you. So this is an example of a really cool shot that I got with continuous focus. So uh, the trick, see, I've been trying to create a picture that looks something like this for a while. And I, I got very frustrated because the shell is always moving when the water hits it. So don't judge me too harshly, but I ended up coming up with a hack for this. I got some little wooden dowels. I cut them about four to five inches and hot glued some shells on top so I could create this vision that I had been wanting to create for a while. I love this image. 
So if I hadn't been using continuous shooting, I would have totally missed this shot because this shot is just this briefest moment where you have these cool little crisp bubbles right on top of the shell. And it's just a split second. So if I hadn't shot continuously, there's no chance I would have gotten this um, or I would have had to be there for a very long time trying to get it. So I'm pretty happy with this image and continuous shooting is definitely what made that possible. So my seventh tip is the same tip that I give people for all types of photography. And it turns out that a beach is no different. Uh, it's so important to tell a story with your picture. The beach can feel very monotonous and it can feel like there's not a lot of diversity in the scenes you can shoot. So the best way to fix that is to focus really hard on telling a story. So the story is obvious with this one. There's a path to the beach and anyone looking at the image can imagine themselves walking down this path and they can imagine their feet in the footprints in the sand and telling that story is gonna help people connect to your image. So this is a good way to beat kind of the boredom and the repetitiveness uh, that you can get with beach shots. And again, it's the same principle that you would use with any other type of landscape photography. And you just have to remember to take those principles and apply it to a different environment. So it's gonna help connect your viewers and some cool ideas is footprints, which is a really classic uh, beach shot. And this is an example of some good pathways. Silhouettes are also a really good way to create a storyline. So I have some great shots that I really enjoy of two people holding hands, walking into the sunset. Sounds cheesy, but it creates a cute story. Uh, and of course you can use things like flip-flops or a beach chair looking out to the ocean, even seashells. These are all things that create stories in your image that's gonna help your viewer connect to it. And it's gonna be a lot more powerful than just a beach shot with a great sunset. Great sunset, great lighting, that's not enough of a story, right? So it can't just be about the clouds. It can't just be about the sky. You have to have something to make a person connect to it. So those are just some suggestions to help you tell stories with your beach images. Uh, I love this picture. It's one of my absolute favorites. Um, I was I saw the pelicans coming along and I knew they were going to fly right by the sun. So I crouched down really low and I zoomed in to compress the scene a little bit. And I waited for the waves to be just right. And of course, I'm using continuous shooting mode to make sure that I get the full motion of this wave and that I don't miss the birds flying through the scene. And it creates this really interesting story of the birds just flying on the shore. And surely we've all seen the birds doing this, but at this moment you can feel the birds moving through the shot and the crispness of the wave. And I love the way that those two things play together. I learned this lesson the hard way, never leave your tripod at home because uh, if I, <laughs> if I had brought my tripod every single time, I would have had a lot more shots. Sometimes you get lazy and my tripod is extremely heavy. So I tend to leave it in the car if I think I'm not gonna need it. And I've regretted that so many times. So always, always don't be like me. Always bring your tripod because uh, you just never know when you're gonna need it. This particular image is from uh, Pensacola Beach right after Hurricane Sally. So if you're not familiar with the hurricanes of the Gulf Coast, Hurricane Sally came through in the fall of this year and it absolutely just decimated the area. The whole beach was flooded. Everyone had to evacuate. It was pretty wild. Um, and I went right out on the beach a couple of days right after and the storm had pushed all these shells up on the beach. And thankfully I had brought my tripod that day and I was able to focus stack this image. And I really, really love this picture because you can see the, the pier is kind of tattered and torn up, missing some of its railings, but you have this beautiful light and these beautiful shells. And I love the story of, you know, there's that's still beauty after a storm, just a metaphor for life, I guess. Um, so you never know when you're going to need a tripod, always bring it. I always do now, even when I don't think I'm gonna use it, I always have it because focus stacking is something you can really do at the beach with uh, the shells and the ripples and the sand. 
You can also do panning, which is great to use a tripod for. And using a long lens, a tripod really helps. So you can always use it and always find a reason to use it. And you definitely don't want to not have it when you want it. Taylor? Yes. Just popping in real quick. Uh, while you're on focus stacking, um, Jeff has asked if you can expand on that a little bit and explain how sure, yeah. you're realizing focus stacking in a beach situation like this. Of course. So focus stacking, you can do it many different ways. A lot of modern cameras, especially some of the newer ones, they have an automated uh, way that you can do it, but I won't explain that because it's going to be different for each camera. But what I can explain is the manual technique for doing it. My personal style, what most people do is I like to get very low and close to whatever my subject is with a wide lens. And I'll get close to it and I set it on manual focus. And then what I do is I bring the focus ring all the way back and I watch for when the very closest part of the image starts to come into focus. At that point, you take your first shot and you very slowly will rotate your focus ring out until you get all the way to the very back in focus. And there's no rule for how many shots this might be. It depends on the depth of your scene and the aperture that you're shooting at. But generally, I think this image was maybe seven or eight uh, stacked shots. And it's because I was using a, a pretty closed aperture. So I didn't need very many, but you could, if you want to get really uh, fine details, you can do as many as 25, or if you do macro photography, you can do far more than that. So it's just the process of taking images that are at different focal points and then combining them later so that you have a fully sharp image from front to back. It can be a lot of fun. It can also be very painstaking. Um, so, cause you have to be willing to commit a little bit of time to it. But it is one of the great ways that you can get good shots of seashells because it's very difficult at the beach to get a shell, which is a very small object right in front of you in focus without completely having the background com just absolutely blurred out. Um, so one of the things that you can do is to stack it and that helps solve the problem. So did I explain that fully enough? Hopefully so. <laughs> if you have more questions, that's okay. We can cover it in the chat later and I'm happy to talk more about it. Taylor, it took me a second to get off of mute. Okay. Um, I think you did a great job of explaining it. Do you, although in, what software do you use to combine the images and is it automated or do you, is it a, is it a completely manual process that you use? Um, okay, <laughs> so there's multiple answers to that question. So I use Photoshop personally. Um, I import the images as layers into Photoshop. And then I at first start with the auto, the automated process. So I will automatically allow Photoshop to align the images. And you'll have to find maybe some YouTube videos to walk you through these particular menu settings because it probably isn't helpful for me to explain them right here. But so I go to auto align and then I go to auto blend mode and I allow Photoshop to do its best guess for stacking. I find that it, it works somewhat, but if you have a really complex image like this where there's not clearly defined lines because you have many, many shells, right? And it's very difficult for Photoshop, which is just a software program to understand where the lines are. So I go in behind Photoshop and I clean it up manually and it can be extremely tedious and time intensive, but in my opinion, it can be worth it because I really like the images that it produces in the end. So it's definitely worth the time investment. Pretty much everybody who looks at focus stacked images, they're like, wow, how'd you get it sharp? And that's the trick. You have to stack it from front to back. It's very difficult to do it in a single shot, so. I think Photoshop, the auto, the auto stack does a pretty good job though. If you don't wanna do the tedious um, manual step after, it does pretty good up front. So it's definitely a good running start. Um, all right, moving along. So 
experimenting with focal length. Lately, I have been obsessed with my 70 to 200 <laughs> long lens. I don't think I've taken it off of my camera because I just started discovering these new ways to see the beach. Shooting with a wide lens is the most obvious choice, right? You, you're going to walk onto the beach. You have this huge landscape. And of course, naturally, you want to put it all in a picture. So almost everyone is going to immediately go for a wide angle lens, and that is fine. You can create amazing pictures with wide angle lenses like the one on the left here. So this is 15 millimeters, nice and low, really wide, focused on the vegetation, and you get lots of sky. So that's a really cool way to get this grand sweeping view. But I have found that I get bored with wide shots way faster than I do with a telephoto lens. Using a zoom is one of the most fun ways to shoot at the beach because I, I could honestly shoot the surf line here with the water droplets flying up, I, I could shoot that for hours and not get bored at all because every single image you create is dif different. They're all unique. Um, they're very dynamic and you can get these cool uh, shapes and motion of the water as it's crashing. I literally, what I do is I have a, a beach blanket and I go and I just lay on my stomach right in the sand, right at the edge of the surf line. And I prop my uh, elbows into the sand and I can shoot this for hours and not get bored. And I never am sorry to have to go through all the images. So a long lens provides you a lot of cool creative opportunities. You can really focus on the, the drops of water that spray up. You can focus on the, the flowers on the shoreline. You can zoom out to the curl of a wave and compress it against the pier. There's all kinds of cool things that you can do with a long lens. And don't forget about the wildlife too, right? There's always going to be a bird or a crab or something for you to shoot. So a long lens is super versatile and people usually don't go for it at first, but I'm a big advocate. So I strongly suggest that you go out to the beach with your long lens and uh, learn to see the beach in a whole different perspective. So that goes right along with varying your shutter speed, right? So a long lens is especially key for getting super fast uh, shutter speed shots. So uh, some tips I have on here, just some fast facts for you. If you want to freeze the water drops, you really, you got to give above 1250. Um, like your shutter speed has to be very, very, very fast or it will not be sharp. If you are below a thousand, when you zoom in, those water droplets will not be sharp. I promise you that. I, it took me a while to dial in the ideal shutter speed. I really try and shoot above 1250 if there's enough light to allow it. So 1600 is definitely my favorite shutter speed for water droplet shots. But of course, when the sun starts going down, that gets really difficult to shoot that fast. So you have to get used to uh, introducing a little bit of noise into your image. I have learned that water and sand is very forgiving if you have to bump your ISO up. So don't be afraid to do it uh, and get that shutter speed really quick so you can get these really fun shots. Um, so varying your shutter speed is a very dynamic way to see the beach. Uh, most people tend to go straight for long exposures and that's fun. I, I enjoy doing long exposures as well, but I've, I've had way more countless hours <laughs> just laying down in the sand and trying to shoot the surf line as it comes in or the little spray that comes up and watching the light dance on it. So I never get bored of doing that. It is really fun. So definitely try bumping up that shutter speed. Um, for an encroaching foam line, I shot this, the one on the bottom is at 1250. So that's pretty fast. You can really start to um, get a sharp foam line around 500. So you don't need to be as fast as I was. Um, so around 500, you can get a pretty sharp foam line, anything slower than that. And you're going to realize that it's not sharp. Um, also pan yes is there a question yes um i'm sharing a question do you, um i'm going to ask the question the way i would ask it scott had asked what iso are you using i would say do you have any parameters on iso will you not go above a certain iso or do you purposely try and keep your iso as low as you can 
what's your position on on the, that setting? So it, it's very specific, right, to the lighting conditions. I try very hard to never go above 600 or 800. Um, I mean, occasionally I'm going to break that rule. I'm pretty sure this top shot was around 800. The bottom one was probably a little less than that. But the sand is very forgiving for noise, right? Because it's naturally textured anyway. Um, so is the foam in the water. It's all very forgiving. So I have grown to be much more comfortable uh, with bumping my ISO up. One of the things that you can do is shoot on shutter priority mode. If you know that you're going, you want to catch water droplets, you need to be above 1250. If you want to simplify the process, put it on shutter priority mode and let your camera figure out the rest. But this is a very important caveat. If you do that, you have to make sure to set an upper limit on your ISO. Most cameras will allow you to do that. If you put it on auto, you can usually set an upper limit and that's very specific to your camera model. I suggest that you kind of look into that for whichever camera you have. But if you don't set an upper limit, you're gonna get crazy high ISO and you really need to make sure that your camera's not gonna try and go above a certain amount. So kind of determine what your threshold is that you're comfortable with and make sure you set a limit if you're going to use shutter priority mode. Um, usually my favorite conditions for shooting these types of shots is right around sunset or sunrise when you can get beautiful side lighting that backlights the water droplets, which is really obvious in the first shot here is that they're, they're side lit by the setting sun and it's creating this nice little glow within them you're not going to have a lot of light to work with. And if you need a fast shutter speed, you're just going to have to, to crank the ISO up a bit. And uh, otherwise you won't be able to get the shot. And I mean, I usually will open my aperture up pretty wide, but I try not to ever go below F4 um, because once you get a super narrow depth of field, say 2.8 to let more light in, you're going to miss so many shots because it's so hard to predict where the wave is going to crash that you're going to be constantly missing shots. So a little bit of ISO can go a long way and uh, help create some images that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So hopefully, I believe it was Scott, hopefully that answers your question. So if there's no other questions about shutter speed. There's we... actually a question about going back to the pier shot, on the pier shot, what lens and what settings for the pier shot where you did focus stacking? Um, I apologize, I should have put my aperture and everything on here. So this is, I took this with, this was back when I was shooting Fuji, um, which is a crop sensor, and I have a 12 millimeter prime, which is roughly an 18 millimeter full frame equivalent. Um, and so it's a pretty wide lens. And if I had to guess, I was probably maybe like a eight or nine on my aperture. I usually stick right around there because that's a really sharp point for my lens. So I try not to deviate too far out of that range. So let's see, there we go. So, I mean, for focus stacking, the name of the game is get low, use a wide lens, get super close to your subject and uh, let the manual or automatic, depending on your camera, focusing kind of do its job and work its magic. All right. So I'm going to yeah. help Taylor. I always am muting out again. So when you finish, just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I right. don't mean. To. So um, talking about shutter speed anyway. So if you're trying to, if you don't want to get bored shooting at the beach, try playing with your shutter speed. It's the same as shooting with uh, different focal lengths on your lens. So just vary your shutter speed and see what happens. It's experimentation as part of the learning process. So I encourage you to go all the way from shooting super fast uh, for water droplets and then try you know, a super long exposure, try all kinds of different things because 
the beach is actually a far more dynamic place to shoot than I ever thought it was. Um, and it has been really fun learning. So hopefully you'll be able to pick up on some of that excitement too. So the beach is a really good place to shoot into the sun. Um, depending on your photography style, most people tend to avoid shooting directly into the sun. For me, I kind of, it's always been part of my style to shoot towards the sun, but the beach is the perfect place to do that, right? But so you have the water and it's creating all this dynamic motion and the sunlight is going to come straight through the water. And it's absolutely magical, especially around sunrise or sunset and the best conditions for this these types of images are the waves in the, the bottom image, the bottom right, where you have this offshore wind that is blowing back the curl of the wave and it's creating this golden mist that the light is coming through. So don't focus away from the sun, always kind of pivot, look towards the sun and see what it's doing to the water because it creates these amazing magical moments uh, where all the mist in the air turns golden and the water gets backlit. So these are moments that you definitely want to capture. Um, and one of the tools for doing this is going to be a graduated ND filter. So definitely a grad filter is your friend. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so grad filters definitely make it possible. I already mentioned shutter priority mode, but I occasionally will use shutter priority mode. Personally, I like to take control of my camera and the beach is a really good place for you to work on your manual uh, putting your camera fully on manual and really beefing up those skills. You have so many different things to take a picture of from the motion and the water to seashells, to wildlife, to people, to there are so many things and you're constantly gonna be moving from subject to subject. Having manual control gives you immediate control over your camera so that you can dial in those settings. Another thing is that Frankly, I, I don't trust most cameras, especially on the very white sand in Pensacola Beach, to help me come up with the right exposure on their own. I never would shoot an auto because I found that I either get super overexposed images or the sand ends up totally gray and flat because the camera doesn't know how to register the white sand the same way that it doesn't measure white snow very well. The camera is always looking for middle gray. And because of that, uh, it's going to be metering above or below and really either over or under expose your, uh, the sand and the foreground and the whiteness of the waves. So taking control, super important. I really, really encourage you if you don't already shoot on manual to beef up those skills if you want to get good at beach photography, because it's going to help you take control of your image and create something that you want to create, whatever your vision is. So when you have these high dynamic range shots, like shooting into the sun, and you have a very, very bright sky and a very, very dark uh, water and shoreline, your camera is not going to meter that very well on its own. You need to take control of your gear um, and make sure that you are creating the artistic vision that you have, right? And don't let your camera decide that for you. So it's the perfect place for you to go and work on these little details where you're practicing things like shutter speed, practicing skills like aperture, and you can really get down and sit there for a while and just enjoy the water and enjoy the wind and practice your skills. So, so take control. Definitely just, uh, again, I put it down here at the bottom. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. If you do shutter priority, don't forget to set an upper limit on that ISO or you're going to end up with very, very grainy images. So very important. I'm a huge nerd, so I made graphics because <laughs> I can't help myself. That's the researcher in me. So something that I, I always have to tell people when they're coming with me to shoot at the beach is know when to use a polarizer, but it's almost as important to know when not to use a polarizer. Using a polarizer is amazing anytime there's water in your scene, right? Because you can cut the glare off of the water and cut the reflected light and really isolate all the rich colors that are actually in your environment. However, the beach creates some cool, well, not so cool challenges for using polarizers, especially if you're using a wide lens. 
if you're trying to shoot really, really fast, it's going to rob you of one to two stops of light. So if you need to shoot really fast, you're probably going to have to ditch the polarizer. The other thing is when you have a wide open horizon, like you do at the beach, which is just an uninterrupted sky, you can run into an issue called banding, especially if you're shooting with a wide lens. So it's something that you have to be aware of, or you're going to end up with shots like this, where you can see the dark splotch in the sky. And this is, it's banding that's created by using a polarizer when I'm shooting a wide lens. So looking at the diagram, it's, the polarizing effect is strongest at 90 degrees from the sun. I promise it's not a math lesson. I'm not gonna teach any algebra right now or geometry, but if you point your finger at the sun, your thumb is roughly at 90 degrees. So if you rotate your wrist, as you can see in the diagram, and if you can see me on the video, that's gonna tell you where the strongest polarizing effect is. When you have an uninterrupted horizon and you're shooting with a wide lens, your field of view can run into where it's not so strong, where it's very strong, and then where it gets weaker again. So the diagram on the bottom will show you at 90 degrees, you can get banding. And I hope I'm not losing you on this because it's a really important concept and I made pretty pictures to try and explain it. So in this image, the sun is behind me to my to the left and it's somewhat low on the horizon. And because of that, if I were to point my finger towards the sun, my thumb would be right where this banding issue is. And it's something that you have to think about when you're shooting at the beach. That's why it's important to know when to use a polarizer and also when not to use a polarizer. And the beach will really test those skills because this problem uh, created by banding can be hard to fix in post-processing. But if you understand in advance what the issue could be, then you can really use a polarizer to your advantage to see through the water and get really rich colors and see the beautiful teal colors of the water. Um, so polarizers are invaluable, but you just wanna make sure that you're using them correctly and that you're looking out for issues that could come up. So I already mentioned that grad filters are your friend and I really mean it. Anytime you see me shooting at the beach during sunset or sunrise, you're probably going to see me with a grad filter on my lens. And the reason for this is because beaches have crazy dynamic range. There's no trees or mountains or anything or buildings to interrupt the amount of light that is coming from the sun. So you are getting the full force of it and the sky is going to be crazy bright and you want all the beautiful colors of the sky and you also don't want a super dark uh, foreground. And the only way for you to do that is to use a grad filter. Now, I know what you might say. You could always bracket an image. And uh, if you don't know what bracketing is, that's when you take an exposure uh, above and below your proper exposure and you can use those together uh, to combine them and create a high dynamic range image. But there's reasons that bracketing rarely will work at the beach, right? Because the waves are always moving and you have other elements that are moving from birds and uh, the sand patterns. You, bracketing is not a good thing to use because you can create what's called ghosting in your image because the picture isn't the same. There's elements that are constantly moving. This image I could not have created if I had bracketed this shot. The waves wouldn't be sharp. The bird would have moved through the frame. The only way you can get it is with a grad filter where you can darken the horizon line uh, and get the whole image properly exposed in a single shot. So grad filters are super important. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of different types of filters. So I personally really like to use a medium grad filter while I'm out here at the beach. So you have the dark part at the top and the clear part at the bottom and it transitions kind of quickly between them, but it doesn't create a hard horizon line. There's just a rapid transition from dark to light. And because you have a nice flat horizon, you can position that medium graduation right around the horizon and it looks very, very natural. Another amazing type of filter, one that I used in this image is called a reverse grad filter. 
So a reverse grad filter, I should have included a diagram in here, is uh, where the dark part of the filter is in the middle, and then it gradually fades up. And it's perfect for when you have the sun on the horizon, you want the darkest part to be where the sun is, and it's going to preserve your highlights in that shot. So a reverse filter is awesome. And sometimes people will use hard grad filters, which is where there's a hard transition from dark to light. Personally, I don't use them because I find that they can be very unforgiving. But if you're very precise with your tripod, it is absolutely a great tool that you can use because uh, you can perfectly line up that transition on the horizon. But you only want to do it when you're using a tripod because if you mess up that horizon, it's very hard to fix. So reverse filters, definitely a favorite. So is a medium grad filter. I see some chats popping in. So if there's questions. Yeah, actually, I'm going to pop in on this because this comes up a lot. Um, so Gary is saying thought on mechanical versus Adobe camera raws digital grad filter. Um, just what your thoughts are on that, but not yeah. quite yet. Um, Lance was asking, can post processing remove ghosting? He thinks that Lightroom has that capability. And then uh, uh, CH Price said something nice about, I happen to have the two-stop medium. It's really nice for this. And um, I'm going to, the one thing that I'm gonna say before you answer Taylor is, is that the one thing about pushing the limits in post-processing and trying to balance mm -hmm. different sections of a photograph is, is that you start getting into um, to artifacts being in the, um, in the uh, regions that you're pushing a little bit too far. Getting, I will always state, and this is a very big point about Nisi filters, that it's very, it's very important to us that our customers understand, the people that use our products understand, that our philosophy is get it right in the camera, yes. save you time for post-processing, for enhancing, not for creating the image that you're after. And I'll, then I'll turn it over to you. Jim, you already you hit on on exactly. And for full disclosure, I shoot Nisi filters because they are the best, in my opinion. I, they're absolutely the best that I've tried. But you can there there are simulated grad filters, right? That you can apply in something like Lightroom, where you pull down and you darken the exposure. But you want, like Jim said, to get the shot right in camera because you're preserving all of the details and all of the information in those individual pixels, right? So what happens is when you're post-processing, if you're just going to try and apply a grad filter, I do it from time to time for a subtle effect, but if you need to adjust a very high dynamic range, like this shot shooting directly into the sun, if I had no grad filter on and I'm trying to drop those highlights, I can assure you I'm going to start getting some very strange colors around the sun, very unrealistic oranges and yellows. Like Jim said, some weird color banding and artifacts. Um, another thing that can happen if you're trying to bring an exposure up or bring it down is that you can wander into a very strange muddy gray color <laughs> that is not the color you want at all. Um, I can very easily identify images that I see online where people have aggressively applied these uh, digital manipulation tools to correct their exposure. And it's they're pretty easy to spot. So you wanna get it right in camera because when you get it right in camera, all the details, all the information, it's still in your image file, right? And you haven't compromised uh, that image at, in any way by altering the pixels by like bringing them up, bringing them down, and you're really preserving the integrity of that file. So I very strongly advocate for getting it right. I, I do get asked this question a lot by clients is, well, I, I don't want to hassle with the grad filter. I'll just fix it in post. And okay. I mean, sometimes you can do that, but when you have a very high dynamic range, I would not advise doing it. You're going to end up with a very muddy and flat looking image. So Hopefully, hopefully that addresses the question. Jim, did I miss anything else? No, but I have more for you. Oh, good. <laughs> so, I <love> questions. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth wants to know if in a GND, um, is she a reverse, a medium, a soft? 
just, I guess, go into that a little bit further. She's, she's particularly interested in sunrise and sunset pictures. Yes, um, I'm actually going to, I have a little diagram. I'm gonna pull it up for you guys. It's gonna be a lot easier if we do it that way. Oops, sorry, I'm in the wrong folder. Let's see, nope. Give me one second, I promise it's gonna be worth it. All right, here we are. This is an image courtesy of Nisi. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, so these are the four primary different types of grad filters, right? So on the far left, which I'm not sure what left is for you guys, but it's the one that my mouse is over. All right, this is a soft filter. And you can see the transition is very, very gradual from the dark area at the top all the way down. It's very soft. And these are square filters. There are similar ones for round filters. So if you're confused, don't worry. It's okay. There's both. Um, so this is very soft. Now over on the complete opposite side, this is going to be a medium. And you can see that the transition is a bit more abrupt. And for beach photography, the reason I go for a medium rather than a soft is because you do have a really nicely defined horizon line. And I don't want that, that darkening effect to bleed into the water very much because the water is already dark. So a medium is probably the first one that I'm going to go for out at the beach because it creates a very, very natural transition. Now I mentioned reverse and reverse is amazing if you are shooting at sunset or sunrise right into the sun, which you often will do at the beach. So this is a reverse and you can see that the dark part is right where the sun would be because during sunset or sunrise, the sun is gonna be near the horizon. It's the brightest part of the sky. So you want the darkest part of your filter to be able to go over that bright area. That's why you have the band of darkness right in the center of the filter, and then it will graduate up slowly to cover the rest of the bright sky. It's a great, great tool. Super, it's, it's, I see far too few people using them. It's really awesome. Uh, it can be very specific and kind of niche for your purpose, but if you're shooting sunsets and sunrises, this is an awesome tool. And then I mentioned a hard filter. That's this one over here where you can see a very defined transition between light and dark. And this defined transition, if you are using a tripod, I can't say that enough. If you are using a tripod, <laughs> you can use this type of filter out at the beach. If you do not properly align that horizon, you, I can guarantee you, will not be able to fix that in post-processing. You're gonna end up with a super weird looking sky or water. So you have to be very careful, but if you're very precise with it and you have an uninterrupted horizon, which you do at the beach, then using something like a hard filter is completely possible. I usually don't do it because I, I'm usually running and gunning. <laughs> so I'm, I'm usually moving pretty quick to take pictures, but if you're taking your time and you're using a tripod, you can definitely rely on that. So hopefully these have been helpful. I'm sorry, I should have included it in, in the presentation slides. So if anyone has questions about the filters before I take down the picture, I can address them. All right, without any further ado, I guess I'll be moving on. <laughs> no, I couldn't find my mute, unmute button. Oh, okay. Elizabeth, Elizabeth does want to, um, oh, that's a great question that just came in. Um, Elizabeth just came in with a question. She said, let me try again. If I were to get a medium GND, how would I, how do I know if I want a two stop, three stop, four wow. stop, or whatever they come in? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it does come in a lot of different uh, strengths. I usually just go for a GND8, which is a three stop filter because it meets, it's the most versatile for me. It works in almost all of my situations and I very rarely find the need for more or less. So I find that to be the most natural looking transition because if you go with too strong of one, it can, it can kind of look unnatural in the image. So. I really, I go for, I go for the three stop G and D eight. Okay. I love this question from Scott. Can you turn the filter upside down? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, I mean, I, 
you know, I, I can probably imagine some reasons like with a reflection that you might want to do something like that. So yeah, the cool thing about one of the reasons I love the, the Nisi, the V6 filter holder is because it very easily will rotate side to side um, because sometimes the sun isn't directly in front of you. Sometimes it's off to the side. So I can tilt the, the graduated filter to meet the brighter part being on the side of my uh, shot instead of directly ahead. So well, yeah. something, something we might even have to get you to play with is our switch folder, which is where you can put in two grads and actually rotate each one independently of each other. Oh, cool. Which is really I like that cool. noise. That sounds fun. <laughs> like, listen, you, um, I, you're at number 13 and I know you have 15. So folks, I'm actually, if you do uh, chat any questions in, if I have to ask Taylor, I'll ask her at the end of the presentation, or you can ask for yourself. But I'm going to pull it on questions right now and let her finish up. Okay. Well, I apparently misnumbered because this is number 14, and apparently I can't count today, which is just a product of it being Monday. Please forgive me. Um, <laughs> so this is actually number 14. <laughs> the uh, last one is long exposures. This is something that I, I really need to play with more personally. Uh, I, I love doing seascape long exposures with like rocks and cool tidal pools. And I haven't leveraged it to the fullest extent out at the beach yet. It's something that I'm working on. Um, so using ND filters, it can help you extend your shutter speed, get some really cool shots that show the motion of the water. And one of the cool things about using ND filters and varying your shutter speed is that you can create different emotions out of your image in different moods. I love that using a longer shutter speed can completely transform your image to have all the energy and excitement with action, which is what I like about this image is that it feels energetic. Even though it's a, a longer shutter speed, you can feel the motion of the water. You can see the waves kind of out and uh, see all the, sh the white strings created by the foam and the wave. Uh, I like the action in it. And you can also do very long exposures, maybe multi-minute exposures to totally smooth out the water and blur the clouds. And that can create a very calming, uh, tranquil mood. And I really like that you can create these different types of moods. So using ND filters is a great way to do it. Always bring your ND filters. This should be right next to your tripod. Never leave your ND filters, never leave your tripod at home. Always have them with you because you just don't know. This was a really crappy day at the beach. I mean, I like I said, I wake up every morning. I go out there even if the conditions are terrible. And this particular day, the conditions were terrible. It was just overcast and ugly. And I just was not very excited to be there but I made myself practice something different and try and create an image. And I ended up with one that I liked because you just, you never know. Using a long exposure allows you to see the world in a different way. And it can transform the picture that you see in front of you. This image would be incredibly boring without that motion in the water. So I was able to create an image that I ended up being happy with. Um, so just the bottom line is this, getting great shots, at the beach is not easy, right? It's, it's a boring environment. There's not a whole lot of subjects. I mean, it feels like this is very frustrating endeavor. Trust me, I felt that at the beginning. I felt like every shot looked the same, but it's a really good place to practice new skills, right? And new skills could be practicing your shutter speed, practicing a focal length, practicing long exposures and using filters. It is a playground for that kind of thing because it's so much more dynamic than say, for example, going out to you know, some rock formations or something. But those I always thought were more interesting until I got to know the beach. And I realized that the beach is far more dynamic than most landscapes I've ever worked with. So it's a perfect place to practice. There's we talked about a couple of things that you can incorporate into your beach photography, like shutter speed, focus stacking, storytelling. I already mentioned the long exposures and the filters. So just playing and experimenting and being willing to try new things in a very challenging environment can be really enriching for your photography. And I promise you're going to come away with more skills than, than you thought you had. So we can move into questions. I guess I'm going to stop my sharing.
Um, this is my information. If you uh, wanted to find me on Instagram or um, on my website, I have lots of photography workshops listed. So if you want to come learn with me, you can come learn. Um, I do a lot of long exposures for some of my workshops that I do waterfalls and all kinds of interesting places. So you can check that out there. And I'm going to stop so we can chat. All right. Hey, well, that was terrific. I, you know, if if everybody wants to applaud virtually, you should. That was really <laughs> Thanks. Great. I'm going to ask some of the questions that I have in chat, and then I'm going to invite people if they want to, you know, come in and, um, and ask their questions live that they can. But one question is, um, what from Jean? She wanted to know what filter for mountains. I, I would assume she meant grad filter because that's where she was at the time. That's what um, Yeah, you're probably gonna wanna use a really like a soft ND filter because you have a disrupted horizon line, right? So it's not completely flat. You have all these other things that are taking place like maybe trees or the hill itself. So you want a soft filter if you're gonna use one at all, just to make sure that you're not creating some obvious, very strange looking transition across part of your subject. So you need to be aware of that. Um, I do see a question about circular or square filters. And I, I get that question constantly. And I tell every single client that I love the square filters, like, because the square filters are very versatile. Um, if you like stacking filters, which I do, I love to stack ND filter and a polarizer and a grad filter. I, I will put every filter on my camera and a square filter system is versatile and allows you to do that. I know that they can be a lot more expensive up front. It's the same thing I tell my clients that I started with circular filters and the amount of money I spent on circular filters, especially not high quality ones, um, constantly trying to upgrade or buy them for different lenses. I, I spent less money just investing in a really high quality square filter system. So that's my two cents on that. But I'll remind you that we do have both. But yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually go down the line here real quick. Uh, do you? Uh, you're. I'm. I want to answer this question myself. Do you have a favorite case or wallet for your filters? The Nisi nine fil nine pocket fil filter pouch is not only a great filter pouch, but it also attaches to the leg of your tripod. So you'll always have your tripod and you'll always have your filters. But do you have any particular cases that you like to use, Taylor? Uh, yeah, the Nisi one's actually pretty robust. So I've yeah. stuck with the original one. <laughs> okay, then there's, do you have any tips for stabilizing your tripod on the wet sand at the surf line? Do you just bring weights? Uh, yeah, that's... That's a struggle. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing that you might have had that struggle if you're asking that question. So I I have learned the sand in the salt water is not going to hurt my tripod. It's not going to. It's not going to. I have to tell myself it's not going to <laughs> because you panic and you don't want to get dirt in it and you don't want to get salt water in it and whatever. Just embrace it and do proper care and maintenance afterwards, I dig that tripod in the sand. Like I dig it down into the sand a couple of inches. If you have spikes, that's also really helpful. Um, a cool hack that I've seen if you're not going to get your tripod in the water is you can use tennis balls and actually cut a little slit in the tennis ball and pop them onto the legs uh, if you're only shooting on the sand and that will keep sand out of your tripod. But usually I'm too far in the water and I've just gotten over the fear and I just dig in. Um, and then I always, always, the second you leave, I never close a wet, salty tripod leg back up. I leave it extended. You know, I look ridiculous putting it in my car. I don't care because I'm not going to get all the sand back into the bushings of the tripod. So I leave it open and I hose it all off. So just proper care and maintenance and just embrace the suck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Nancy asks, I use mostly 77 millimeter lenses. Would it be the, the 100 millimeter or the 150? Um, go, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry what was if the I answered that maybe I didn't she's saying that her her lens diameter is 77 millimeter mm -hmm. and uh, would the Nisi 100 millimeter wide or 150 wide 
kids be better a better fit? Um, Jim, you might be better equipped to answer that, but I, I think the, I have a 77 and I use a 100 millimeter kit and a, it's actually more important to know what your widest lens is. Mm -hmm. You know, you can use the 100 millimeter, uh, filters on lenses down to 16 millimeters full frame without, without any vignetting. You can actually go a little bit further. We've been, um, we've been using a hundred millimeter system, uh, on a, uh, on the new Nikon Z uh, 14 to 24. And, um, if you rotate it, you get slight bit of vignetting, but, uh, nothing, nothing that's going to bother the image and you crop it a little bit and then straight on straight up and down or sideways. It's, there's no vignetting at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and the 100 millimeter system, Nancy, is good up to 82 millimeter. It's also good up to 95 millimeter, but you'll lose the uh, circular polarizer. Right. Okay. Furniture casters? I don't know what that, that's just asked. Furniture casters, sure. <laughs> Furniture casters. Um, should you spray the, the tripod with food grade silicon to avoid the salt water from sticking to it? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't I know I've done that. Like I said, I just proper care and maintenance just rinse it off afterwards. And occasionally you're going to have to disassemble it and clean the bushings of your tripod. But that's just yeah. proper care. It's what you do when you invest money in good equipment to take care of it. Uh, someone asking about which square filters would you suggest? I live in Montana. Um, you know, I'm going to say filters. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I, I assume you, you want Nisi filters if you're watching us, but I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, just make sure they're good. Uh, I, but, um, I would say that if you were going to go bare bones, um, bare bones is a six stop yes. and a medium grad. That would be bare bones. A hundred percent. That's exactly what I would say. My, my very bare minimum, if you're going to get a square filter system, the six stop is so versatile. And if it's not enough, add a polarizer and you're probably good to go. Um, so the six stop is awesome for all kinds of things. You can it really extend your shutter speed for waterfalls, for coastal stuff, for you can maybe even get some blurred clouds out of a six stop. So really great, really great. And if you buy our filters in our kits, uh, that's a good savings as well. And now it might be a good time for me to remind everyone, and I hope uh, Andrew's on board here, that we have a discount to offer our uh, viewers on Nisi to celebrate Taylor presenting for us. We are offering a 15% discount on all Nisi except our new Sunstar lens, um, because we can't afford to give you 15% off on that. But 15% uh, off any other uh, Nisi kits or filters or holders or close-up lenses or anything else that we've got. You just have to remember to spell my name right. <laughs> it's a pop quiz. <laughs> it's very cool. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah, I thank my parents for that one. <laughs> uh, do you use the Nisi app to calculate your exposure settings I or just do. one? I do actually. Yeah, I, I like the, So there's a million different apps to help you cal calculate your exposure. I have the Nisi one for sure. That one works really well. Um, I mean, the more you practice with long exposures, the more you kind of will intuitively know for the ones that are not super long. But once you get more than like 30 seconds to like a minute, then I definitely will use a calculator app. It's really just, you just have to practice, 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 practice. Um, and the long exposures will come very naturally the more you do it, so. All right, well, I'm gonna take a, a, just a few more minutes here to let, if anyone wants to, uh, turn off their mic, ask a question, then turn their mic, or turn their mic on, ask a question, then turn their mic back off, um, or say hi or thank you, you know. I see a question from Lance about using the, how do you consider the polarizer when calculating your exposure? It's funny because, okay, so I'm, I'm actually building an online course for filters right now. So I just wrote this chapter. <laughs> so you always, always will, 
put your polarizer on first and then calculate your exposure, right? So you're gonna include, if, and that goes the same with the graduated filter, you put them on first, get your baseline exposure, and then you will calculate from there because you're, you can get your exposure through live view by already having those things on. And it saves you the trouble of playing a guessing game later of, well, is my polarizer a one stop or two stop or how precise is it? Skip all that mess go ahead and put it on before you start calculating and it's gonna be way easier for you. Actually, the way that the V6 and our other holders are designed, our square holders are designed. By the way, for people who use smaller mirrorless cameras, we make a 75 millimeter version of our uh, filter kits as well. So if you don't exceed 67 millimeter thread on your lens, we have the uh, M75 and then we have the big S6 for your lenses that have, that are the ultra wide lenses. But the idea with ours is the filter holder snaps on and off in, uh, in front of the circular yes. polarizer so that. you can take your base exposure and it becomes very, very, it becomes very, very um, uh, easy to get a base exposure, pop your filter set on, take the pictures that you're taking, pop it off, move a little bit and, and, and shoot very rapidly with a, with a system that's normally kind of arduous to use. It's one of the cool things about our, our system is, is that it's very um, easy to manipulate in the field. Mm -hmm. I, I see a question about UV filters. So I feel like this is a topic of some debate because some people are really big on UV filters and some people don't use them. Um, me personally, I never use a UV filter. Um, the reason is because I want as little as possible between my glass, my high quality lens glass and the image that I'm trying to get a picture of. And especially when I'm out at the beach, you're gonna get this really grimy like marine film that comes on your glass. It is constant, it is a constant battle. And that's one of the reasons I recommend the wipes is that you're gonna be constantly trying to clean your lens. So having that UV filter on, personally, I feel like it just gets in the way, but I, I feel like that's a personal choice. People seem to go back and forth on it. So Maybe I can see that argument the other way too. Most lenses now are nano coated. And one of the benefits of being nano coated is that they're very resistant to uh, damage from dirt and everything. As long as you take care and no object, as you mentioned before, like a, a grit of sand or salt oh, gosh, yeah. between the cloth or the wipe and the uh, glass is not there. Um, I will say this, if if you're shooting with, uh, if you're shooting in, in these bad conditions a lot and you really want to feel better about it, as long as you buy a good quality UV filter, in particular a Nisi filter, but a good, good quality filter, yes. the price will pretty much tell you whether the filter is good or not. Then you'll, um, th then you're not going to really be um, compromising your image quality too badly. Yeah. Um, Oh, and uh, I'd say on the lens wipes, I like the Zeiss ones. They're I guess that's what I use too. The, I mean, you can get a box of 600 of them for 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard to beat and they're high quality. Now also, uh, just a quick question, because I, I always hate when my questions are run over when I'm on a chat. Um, the uh, the uh, grad filters do come in a variety of uh, stops. It's not as, it's not as wide as just the, um, the ND filters that we have, but they're usually two, three, four stops. Some of them we have five, they're all on our website for you to take a look at. Uh, someone asked about a lens shade. Uh, lens shade is something very, very important. And um, I will tell you that we are looking at, an, at a lens shade solution for square filters. It's a little tricky because, you know, we're fighting against the vignetting, but we are trying to get a lens shade. It, 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 is, it is a good thing to have when, when, mm. when you can use it. Yeah, a lens hood can also be really helpful out at the beach because it's going to block some of that spray that's going to be coming at you. So um, definitely is a helpful thing. And you have to, if you're shooting with square filter system, there is a trade-off. So you just need to weigh your options and figure out what is most important to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's an ever, 
it's an ever evolving hobby. You can you can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. You can always buy more gear, right, Jim? <laughs> it's never ending. I make my living, so please do. But uh, <laughs> but I also I, I I know it I know it can get expensive. I will tell you that um, you know this is a good opportunity. The fifteen percent off is a good opportunity. Buying our filters and kits is a very good cost saving opportunity. Uh, watch for sales. A lot of our dealers, we authorize our dealers to run sales from time to time. We run sales. We run sales from time to time. Um, just, you know, the best thing to do is just follow us on Instagram. Follow Nisi Optics USA on Instagram. You'll hear about anything that's going on. If a dealer in Florida is running a, a sale, we'll, we'll throw a little uh, shout out to them. This is the week to buy your filter from them or that there's always ways to save money. And, uh, and then for you people that wait until the very last minute, not only will we sell to you at full price, but we'll even send it overnight for a nice additional charge. You can't believe how many people we get that I'm leaving for, I'm leaving for the Galapagos tomorrow. Can I get it priority first day? First, first delivery and it's like you know, you know it costs a lot of money but yep okay <laughs> so um i see a question about the 14 to 24 nikon i know that there is a solution for it jim do you want to talk about well, it? we have a, we have a 100 millimeter solution now that'll go directly on the 14 to 24 it's unlike the v6 and like the s6 which is the big filter set in that you can't put a polarizer behind it. Uh, one of our unique features is, is that we put a rotating polarizer behind the filters. The 100 uh, solution for the new Z14 to 24, you don't have a circular polarizer. What you can do is you can buy our square polarizer and incorporate it into it. Now, the one thing that people seem to forget about the 14 to 24 is, is that a polarizer, you, you will have banding issues with a polarizer on a 14 millimeter anyway. So the holder without the polarizer is really not a bad thing, but we are coming out with the S6, which is the 150 millimeter solution that will have our circular enhanced landscape polarizer uh, in front of the lens. And then you can stack two um, square or rectangular filters in front of them. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Did anyone else have any questions about the beach stuff? Hopefully it was helpful. Like, honestly, I, I, have, I had a phobia of shooting at the beach for the longest time. I avoided it like the plague. And well, I'm glad that I finally learned it to embrace it. Well, what's funny is, is that when we first started talking, Taylor, you said, oh, I could do a great thing on waterfalls and it's like but, I just, but someone just did a waterfall <laughs> webinar for you and I'm like I'm different people come at different times let's work up a waterfall so yeah. I think we get a lot of great people there it's funny because talking for Nisi has been perfect for me during COVID because uh, I had two self-improvement projects that I did during the quarantine period and both of them are just full of filters. So the other thing that I did besides shooting at the beach every day that I could was that I was determined to hike to all of the waterfalls in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment region. And I've gotten to about 280 out of 800. So I'm working on it. <laughs> so that's a lot of long exposures. <laughs> webinar to me. So <laughs> folks, um, I guess we're going to wrap things up. I hope that's okay. And I just want you to know that um, Nisi Optics USA is always available to answer questions. You can reach us through chat. You can reach us through email. You can call us uh, nine to five on the West Coast, Monday through Friday. Happy to do that. Taylor put up her information as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure she would love to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. Just in case anyone wants to, honestly, I'm very, very approachable. You can always, always, always message me. I will always answer 100% of the time. So um, I'm very available. If you have questions about settings or editing or anything, just ask. Uh, I'm here to help. Fantastic. Well, uh, if it's okay, everyone, we're going to say good night. Thank you so much. 
And um, again, feel free to reach out if you ever uh, have any questions or want to share some comments with us. And by the way, when you've got a picture that you're really proud of, put the hashtag Nisi Optics USA on it and post it on Instagram or Facebook. Chances are we're going to see it. And if we, uh, you know, catch us in the right mood, we might even post it on one of our channels as well and give you a nice big credit for it. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks guys. I appreciate you spending your Monday evening with me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey, Kenny, I see you on here. <laughs>